With us today to talk about the growing problem of gun violence domestically and abroad is Ian Overton, the Executive Director of Action on Armed Violence. In this role, he heads up a charity that investigates the impact of explosive weapons and small arms on civilians around the world. It is a job that has required him to travel to a number of areas heavily impacted by armed violence, including Ukraine, El Salvador, and the Syrian-Jordanian border. In this capacity, he has also written for The Guardian, The LA Times, The Independent, and The Huffington Post, and The IB Times. He has been witness to the devastating impact of armed violence on numerous occasions and has reported on conflicts or extremes of violence all over the world. His human rights reporting has been awarded a Peabody Award, two Amnesty Awards, and a BAFTA Scotland, among others. He has spoken at the United Nations, the Oxford Union, Harvard, Cambridge, and Chatham, Chatham House, amongst others, and he is the author of the book, The Way of the Gun, A Bloody Journey into the World of Firearms. We are so honored to have Mr. Overton here on Middle East in Focus. Thanks so much, Mr. Overton, for joining us. Hey, that was quite some introduction. Oh, why, thank, thank you. <laughs> well, you have a, quite an incredible bio, and not because of all the credentials, but again, because the work you're doing is really important. And, you know, from everything that I've read um, in terms of your writings and actually other people's commentary on your work is that it really comes from the heart and from a place of genuine passion that said, um, you know, which is what we need, especially at times like these. This is that's how we need to be talking about these issues. Um, so I know it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting comment because, to be honest, um, uh, you know, when I do talk about guns, I do get a lot of hostility from Americans, and um, you know, I, I try and think like I'm trying to work on the on the side of good. You know, I'm trying to say that that, that we should address armed violence, we should address mass killing. And, uh, and yet, you know, the, the hostility I get from some Americans has been, you know, very acute from death threats all the way, you know, through to, to very personal insults. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the only country in the world where I, I do get regularly attacked on social media. So uh, it's very nice to hear somebody from America being um, uh, complimentary about my work. Thank you. Well, and I, and I actually think that, you know, in light of the unbelievable amounts of innocent civilians that have been lost to gun violence both domestically and abroad and with this recent Orlando massacre there is a lot more awareness and conversation about gun violence and the need to you know again eradicate it that said can you talk about the connection between the Orlando massacre and this issue of global gun violence well firstly um, gun massacres in the U.S where four or more people are killed in a single incident involving guns um, is a relatively rare phenomenon when you look at the, the entirety of gun deaths in the U.S. So it's around 2 to 5%, depending on the number of people killed per year. But it's not really the majority, but of course it gets the majority air times. As you said just before um, you introduced me, the, uh, the, the day before the Orlando shootings, there was a considerable number of, of, of smaller level um, numbers killed um, on, a, on a singular basis, but cumulatively um, that adds up. And in the U.S., every year around 10,000 people are killed by guns in homicides, and a further 20,000 people shoot themselves. Now, that, that toll is 30,000 dead. Um, what we also um, should be aware of is that in the, in the U.S., um, in the last decade, your doctors have really gone through the, 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 the fire of learning in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and they've really learned how to um, basically save somebody's life when they're impacted in, in gunfire. So you've got a lot of army and medical trained personnel coming back who have really seen war close up, and they know how to stitch somebody up in your accident emergency centers around the state. So the chances of you surviving from gunshots with the progression of science and the advancement of medical knowledge is much, much higher now. So the CDC reports that almost for around every one person shot and killed, as many as nine people are surviving. So you really have this hidden epidemic um, of gun violence that, that really isn't addressed by the media because the media focuses on mass shootings and deaths rather than injuries. So there's this major problem that um, in 2012, for instance, 
as many as 110,000 people were either killed or injured by guns just in the United States. Now, how does this play out when you compare the U.S. to the rest of the world? Well, in terms of developed countries, the U.S. is a massive outlier. To be frank, in Europe, we look at the U.S. with mouths wide open. You have levels of violence and gun violence that are beyond our knowledge. And people sometimes ludicrously say that England is more violent than the U.S. because they've read and misread one of our, our reports on numbers of violent acts that occur uh, by police. But the trouble is, in Britain, we lift a violent act like somebody pushing you in a pub. I mean, it's as benign as that. Well, that, that is listed on our, on our national statistics. In the U.S., you pretty much have to be killed for the police to list it. So there is, the U.S. is a very violent place from a developed nation perspective, and that is consistent across the board. However, when it comes to global analysis, um, the U.S. is significantly less violence in some parts of the world. Now, this is partly because you have highly developed rule of law, partly because you're a relatively rich nation a per capita, partly because you've got a, a well-educated populace, and partly because um, there are certain pockets of the states which are very, very peaceful. And obviously, there's certain pockets of the state that are very, very violent. But if you compare that the pe most peaceful city in the United States for the last three years running is El Paso in Texas. Now, just across the border, is Ciudad Juarez that has been listed as one of the most dangerous cities in the world consistently over the last decade. Um, so the division between heaven and hell there is a borderline. Um, but when you go to places like El Salvador, Honduras, obviously Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, small arms violence, gun violence is endemic. Um, and just as a, as a casual comment, I went to a place called San Pedro Sula in Honduras writing this book, The Way of the Gun, and in three, in three days that I was there, I witnessed 14 murders or the direct consequence of murders. Um, and the moment I landed, my, the plane landed, three women were gunned down in the street, um, and this barely even got national news. Uh, well, I don't think it even did, actually. It got local news. And, and that is the extent of violence in other parts of the world. But the question is, is what's the U.S. role in that level of violence, and that is something which I really address in the book. Well, and, and actually, if we can turn to that next question, what is the level of America? What is the level of America's role in this global gun violence? And again, I think, you know, and you, I mean, again, you're the expert, so you can say whether or not small arms and explosive weapons are included in this conversation, but also yeah. where does the weapons manufacturing companies come into play in all of this and the level of profit that they're making from the um, massive access to guns and explosive weapons and small arms? Okay, well, well to start off with your first question about the, the Second Amendment's role in, in global gun violence and why the U.S.'s constitutional right to bear arms should worry people outside the U.S.'s border. Well, let's start off with the first thing, is the U.S. is virtually unique in having a constitutional right to bear arms. Uh, and this, um, I think, frames something in a very um, curious position in terms of the, without the U.S., a lot of gun manufacturers around the world would really struggle with their profit margins that they show today. The U.S. accounts for around 50% of global gun sales. So if you took the U.S. out of the equation, you would have significantly less profits by a lot of other gun manufacturers, particularly European gun manufacturers. The, 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 in, in addition, that would lead to less profits would lead, lead to less lobbying on the part of gun, gun lobbyists, um, both in America and elsewhere. And also, I think, um, I mean, it's pretty self-evident that the more vibrant an industry is and the more money is to be made in industry, then the more that um, marketing and, and advertising can be placed there to make a gun ownership seem like an attractive thing. So that's the first thing. The very weight of America's gun economy influences the global economy. Secondly, I believe that the Second Amendment, uh, uh, resulting in a proliferation of arms in America, leads to very high levels of smuggling of guns, particularly from America down into Mexico and, cent and Central America. So it's estimated that as many as 250,000 guns are smuggled south of the border of Mexico um, every single year. Now, people say, well, well you know, um, does that have an effect? Well, actually it does. When Cl the Clinton administration ban on semi-automatic weapons was lifted in 2003, um, California did not lift, lift that ban. And directly south of the border of California, you did not see a rise in homicides. However, south of the border of 
Arizona and Texas, which did lift the ban, saw a sharp rise in homicides. So there is a cause and effect of, um, of American guns resulting in violence in Mexico um, and Central America. And these levels of violence are huge. As many as 100,000 people have been killed in the last decade in, in Mexico by guns. Um, when it comes to the third thing, I believe that the Second Amendment right to bear arms influences American foreign policy. There is it's almost assumption, I think, at the very high levels of, of America that um, you can export democracy at, with the barrel of the gun. And this is borne out by the fact that in, since the beginning of the war on terror, um, the U.S. Department of Defense has spent billions, I think around $40 billion worth of contracts, just on small arms, ammunition and attachments have been issued by the Department of Defense. And in addition, they've exported around a million um, AK-47s to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, um, we know by U.S. Department of Defense um, audit that a significant number of those have been lost. So something in the region of 465,000 AK-47s have been admitted to have been lost by the U.S. government in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, of course, these very, very, very po probably have, handed up in the, have ended up in the hands of ISIS and the Taliban. So that's the third reason why we should be um, scared of the Second Amendment internationally, or scared or, or concerned, should I say, because there is a genuine um, uh, impulse by the U.S. Department of Defense to just start exporting guns willy-nilly, believing peace will ensue. And then the final thing, is that the U.S. lobby, led by the National Rifle Association, um, which has po poured in $35 million into um, your own, your own uh, government debates in the last 10 years, not only has the NRA pushed in massive amounts nationally into debates, but also it's influenced the international debate. So in the United Nations, uh, the Arms Trade Treaty and another U.N. treaty called the Program of Action were heavily influenced by the NRA lobby group trying to, trying to discredit it. So much so that Amnesty International had to tell the NRA to stop their campaign of lies around the arms trade treaty. And just take, to have this as one final giveaway, John Bolton, I don't know if you remember him, UN ambassador in the United Nations, guy with a walrus moustache, he heavily watered down the one attempt by the United Nations to stop international illegal trafficking of guns in the program of action. And he is now um, the chair of the international subcommittee of the NRA. Mm. So there's a pretty definite link. Now, when you wrap all of this up into who's profiting from this, there are some massive profits to be made. Um, I don't know if you remember, and, and I'm sure it's etched in everyone's uh, memory listening in, the Sandy Hook massacre. There was a terrible AR-15 semi-automatic rifle used there called the Bushmaster. Now, the Bushmaster is part of a slate of um, products from a company um, that is overseen by a group called the Freedom Group. Now, the Freedom Group is this um, is the largest producer or manufacturer of guns in the world, and the Freedom Group is run by a capital management group called Cerberus Capital Management. Um, its CEO, by the way, is having dinner with Trump later this week, um, and uh, a guy called Feinberg. Now, Feinberg is a, is a billionaire. And he's massively bankrolled um, a lot of American politicians in, in pushing them to support the, the, um, the NRA and gun, and gun liberty in the U.S. Um, but in addition, um, what I think is very, very uh, representative, the sort of people who work at Cerberus and, and Freedom Group, is this, is that after the Sandy Hook massacre, which actually happened, um, it's, it's, uh, Feinberg's father-in-law lives in Sandy Hook, so it happened in, in his father-in-law's hometown. But um, after that, Feinberg said he would divest uh, his company from Bushmaster, who were the producers of the rifle that killed all those children. That's what he said publicly. He went out saying, we're going to start selling off our, sh our, our ownership of Bushmaster. Um, Twelve months later, absolutely no sign whatsoever that they sold it. In fact, they made, the, they made massive profits in the year following um, Sandy Hook Massacre, because sadly, every single time there's a massacre in the U.S., gun sales start um, pushing up. And I, I, we want to talk about that actually next. Let me just 
remind everyone that this is Middle East in Focus. We are talking about the Orlando massacre and the problem of gun violence domestically and internationally with our guest, Ian Overton, executive director of the London-based organization Action on Armed Violence and author of the book, The Way of the Gun, A Bloody Journey into the World of Firearms. Uh, Mr. Overton, you, you spoke a little bit about the lies that are um, propagated by the NRA, and and then you also um, continued to talk about how there was actually a rise in um, gun purchases uh, after there's a massacre. Can you talk about the relationship in terms of the lies by the NRA that get propagated and this rise in gun ownership, if there is a relationship? Well, I think it's one of the biggest challenges in America is that because of NRA lobbying, the Centers for Disease Control basically had to suspend its research into gun violence. So there's, there, there's no state-sponsored or federal-sponsored research into gun violence. And into that space of an absence of there being coherent research, what you get is NRA-sponsored academics pushing out terribly reviewed um, literature uh, or, or literature that really doesn't stand up to proper review um, that basically says that more guns do not equal more gun deaths. Now, one of the biggest problems in the world is proving cause and effect. Um, there are lots of cases where you can have situations where there are guns, but they're not, there's not gun violence. And Iceland is a great example. However, that's not the case in the U.S. There are lots of guns in the U.S. and there's lots of gun violence. And they've shown that in states with more uh, restrictive gun laws, there are less gun violence. However, the NRA propagates this mantra that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And so two things happen after a massacre. The first, and particularly in recent years, is the first is the NRA starts pushing out more advertising, telling people that the best way to defend yourself is to go out and arm yourself. Um, and if you listen to the NRA's annual speeches, it's like the, the zombie horde is at your door. The urgency to go and arm yourself with lots of guns is never more apparent. Um, and, th and this is part of a marketing tactic, because to be honest, if you buy one gun, why would you need another? So the idea that is more and more fear out there, um, in a way, makes you want to go and buy a second gun or a third gun. So it's a good marketing tool. But, um, but the flip side of this is when President Obama, as he's done a number of times, stands up and says that we need to have a proper grown-up discussion uh, about gun control, um, gun sales rise because there's a, there's a minority of Americans, and there's a minority, who are so fearful of a despotic government coming to take away their guns that they immediately assume that the word gun control means sort of the rise of totalitarianism. Of course, that's bunkum, um, A. And secondly... The idea that if you went and bought yourself a pistol um, and you actually had to stand up against the National Guard who are coming down on you to enforce their will, um, you're not going to survive against a, an Apache helicopter. But nonetheless, um, the, there is this some deep-rooted fear in America, not only of your neighbor being a serial killer and coming to kill you, so you better have six um, rifles under your bed, but there's also a fear um, of a, a, a government coming to take away your guns. Now, I can understand if you're living in a remote part of the States and the police are 25 minutes away that, you know, you might want to have some form of defense. I understand there is this need, but the hard evidence shows that you're far more likely to end up with a domestic incident resulting in a gun death, that you're far more likely, if you're a woman married to a man who's abusive with a gun in the house, that you'll end up being a victim. You're far more likely to kill yourself than to be killed in the U.S., that actually a gun ends up um, being a problem when it comes to ownership, and it doesn't make you safer. There's no evidence that gun ownership makes you safer. Um, the, around 2% of mass shooters in the U.S. have actually been stopped by armed civilians. The vast majority are either killed by police or killed themselves. Um, so this idea that you're really going to be able to defend yourself against an armed, unarmed attack is pretty low on the, on the, on, on the ratio of, of actual um, likelihood. Um, the, the, the greatest likelihood is um, that you're not going to be attacked, first and foremost. And secondly, that if you do have a gun, you're far more likely in a moment of depression to actually end your own life with it than you will be to end the life of an attacker. And Mr. Overton, can you talk about, and you, you, you spoke a little bit about it um, before, but in more detail, 
how gun control in America will not just affect Americans, but could benefit the entire world. And what specific types of gun control policies do you feel are the most necessary to implement in light of everything that is happening? Well, first and foremost, I think America um, absolutely leads the way, not only um, in terms of um, gun sales and production, but it also is very influential. So the NRA has international reach. The NRA has been involved in major um, campaigns, as I said, at the United Nations, trying to um, uh, repress international arms trade uh, agreements but has also been involved in Central American, Caribbean, and South American attempts to reduce gun violence. So when Brazil, um, which has the highest number of people killed by guns in any country in the world every year, um, tried to implement tougher gun laws, the NRA got involved. So I think if we could um, collectively try and work out a way to stand up to the NRA and to reduce its influence, um, ultimately international treaties at the UN that try to regulate the international arms industry would, I think, get more potency and force. Um, The other thing, though, of course, is that if the United Nations, I'm sorry, if the United States implemented gun control, And there was a significant drop in gun-related homicides in the U.S., as I believe there would be. This would be a very, very strong message to a lot of other nations who might be teetering on the edge of whether they should implement tougher gun laws or not to go ahead and do it. But at the moment, the trouble is, is that whenever there's a gun massacre in the United States, the United States is the only country in the world, not, not with every single massacre, but collectively, the only country in the world that has loosened their gun laws following a gun massacre rather than tightened them. And I think this sends out a very weird message, and it ends up empowering people, um, to uh, empowering the NRA to continue its lobbying efforts. As for what could be done in the U.S., well, if you look at the number of homicides committed in the U.S., um, we do fixate on things like semi-automatic um, uh, assault rifles, AR-15. That's considered uh, you know, the, the thing that is, is most popularly used in, in mass shootings. Actually, most mass shootings um, are actually used or involve a handgun. And certainly all um, around 90% of homicides in the U.S. that involve a gun involve a handgun. So I would say, as we have in Britain, um, a comprehensive um, um, regulation of handgun ownership would end up um, having a significant impact on, on gun crime in the U.S. If you, can, if you could say that in order to have a handgun, you had to be registered, you had to have um, a, um, a doctor uh, saying that you could have a gun or, you, or you, you had to have a whole series of other interventions, as they do in Europe, as they do in, in most parts of the world, I think it would significantly have an impact on, on gun homicides. And the point is, is if you are regular, and I'm sure most of your listeners are, you know, um, if, or the, if they're gun owners, I'm sure they have absolutely no intention any day of the week to use it aggressively. That's the last thing they want to use it for. But if you shifted in America from this culture of ownership of a gun to self-protection to a position where most people, as they do in Canada, own guns for hunting and for sport, I think the culture around guns would shift too, that people wouldn't immediately reach their gun and argument and end it with a lifetime prison sentence. Um, you would shift into a situation where guns became harder and harder to buy. I mean, recently we just had a, an MP shot in the UK, um, and the guy had to buy a gun manual from the US to make that gun um, in order to kill her, because you can't go out and buy a handgun in the UK without lots and lots of regulation. So it gets to that sort of rarity to actually end up assassinating somebody, as he sought to do. But I think these sort of things should become more of a debate in the U.S. My my big criticism, I guess, of the U.S. way in which it reports on gun violence is twofold. Firstly, there's too much fixation on the dead, and I think if if more reports were done on how many people are wounded, it would significantly show how massive the problem is. And secondly, I think there should be more of a debate about pistol ownership because it's handguns that cause the vast majority of homicides and suicides. This is Middle East in Focus, and we are talking about the Orlando Massacre and the problem of gun violence domestically and internationally with our guest, Ian Overton, Executive Director of the London-based organization Action on Armed Violence and author of the book, The Way of the Gun, A Bloody Journey into the World of Firearms. Mr. Overton, you know, we're we're nearing the end of the segment, um, and I think one of the things that um, I've spoken to a lot of people about 
is the kind of ways in which a tragedy like we're seeing with respect to innocent lives being lost domestically and internationally to gun violence, what we also see in those tragic moments is an incredible sense of humanity as well through the work of people like yourself. What important lessons can we learn from what happened in Orlando? How can we heal as a humanity from these events and the many countless others that have happened and will continue to happen unless we do something about it? Well, often tragedies like these, what they do is they reveal um, dark rivers of reality that underpin a lot of people's daily lives. And we saw straight after the Orlando massacre, a huge meeting um, of uh, people um, either from or in support of the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender communities um, uh, uh, appearing on the streets of London. And a lot of people um, there, and I spoke to uh, a number of them, and a number of them are, are very good friends of mine, and I, I was upset I couldn't make it there that evening. Um, a lot of them uh, talked about how that actually there are these dark rivers of um, homophobia and prejudice that go through society. And I think sometimes it takes a terrible massacre like this for us to suddenly sit up and think, you know what, this is just um, the ugly peak of a, a, a rising tide of intolerance and anger that's often coming um, from, you know, angry, um, uh, or, or sometimes from angry white men. In this case, it was an angry uh, Muslim man, but generally, um, or an, a, a man from an Afghan heritage. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think that there is an opportunity for us to pause and take breath here and to say, look, um, what is the best way to respond to this? Should we respond in anger or should we respond through the mechanism of love and to show that love should conquer? Now, um, I believe fundamentally that the more we reveal man's inhumanity to man by recording it, which is what we do um, at Action on Armed Violence, we record explosive violence and the number of civilians killed there, and we record, um, uh, we, I run a program called gunmassacre.org, where we look at how many gun massacres occur around the world. And with those two uh, um, programs, what I hope to achieve is to show the quantity of inhumanity to man that exists, and through that seek to have um, direct intervention, either through the, the form of um, um, charitable programs that go to try to address the harm wrought on civilians by these weapons of mass destruction, um, or because they are, I mean, um, the number of people killed by guns with explosive weapons is in its hundreds of thousands every single year, um, or um, at least we begin a debate as to what are the very root causes, why is there this um, hatred un underpinning. And for me, I want to investigate the rationale behind mass shooters, just as I want to investigate the rationale behind suicide bombers, because I think they're both driven by this warped view of the world where they believe that hatred will, um, is a tool to combat what they see as intolerance um, in the world. They are intolerant of other people's lifestyles. And clearly, their actions mean nothing. And what I think we ultimately record is that even though all this violence occurs, life still goes on. We should reduce the violence, but we also should reflect that underpinning it is man's greatest capacity for love, for acceptance, for humility, for honesty, and for noble, nobleness. And I think within them, and within the, the spreading of the desire for us to love, not hate, to tolerate, not to condemn, um, and to seek our better natures, then hopefully we will make the world a better place. And Mr. Overton, I, I just have one last, actually two last follow-up questions, and then we'll wrap it up. You know, um, you spoke a little bit about individual accountability for those who perpetrate um, crimes of violence against innocent civilians. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of corporate accountability? And, and we again, we spoke a little bit about it earlier regarding um, weapons manufacturing companies, but how can we institute greater corporate accountability with respect to gun violence? Well, C.S. Lewis once described hell um, as basically a well-run business where men with clean fingernails sit in well-lit offices and push around papers. And to me, this goes to the very root of what we have to um, question ourselves at. It's because it's very easy in a world where product and consumer are often very dislocated and in the middle is the salesman, so where something is produced is often far away from where it's consumed. 
my book basically attempts to look at the fact that the businessmen who make huge profits out of guns never see the consequences of their actions. Um, politician lobbyists who um, always argue for your right to bear arms haven't been to El Salvador, Honduras, or Iraq, or Afghanistan like I had. So I've seen close up. I mean, I've been held up at gunpoint three times. I've been shot at more times than I care to say. I've seen close up the hard end of gun violence, and I've really experienced it. And I can tell you that the gang members who I've met in El Salvador have, who have you know, heavily tattooed or killed dozens of people, they are so disconnected from the world of commerce in New York, where um, Stephen Feinberg sits as, a, as the CEO of the la world's largest um, arms company or, um, uh, or underpinning it through his finances, um, he doesn't realize the consequences of his actions. Now, I think that um, there needs to be uh, ways in which we communicate to these CEOs, these people who you know live very, very comfortable lives and never see violence close up, we should communicate to them that actually this is the consequence of their actions. Um, and that could be in the form of, of, of direct action, emailing them, um, trying to lobby at them, trying to maybe um, uh, put a moratorium on purchasing some of their, their, their products and hitting them where it hurts their pockets. But I also believe there needs to be state responsibility. And to ask the question, is it right, for instance, that Stephen Feinberg um, not only is um, somebody who, who, market, who bankrolls a large gun company that produced a gun that killed people in Sandy Hook, but simultaneously he also runs a, um, a, a hospital service um, in the same county um, that provides support for people shot by guns. I mean, he, he profits from the sale of the gun and patching up that individual. Um, and I find that absolutely incredible that that sort of information isn't made more public and that ultimately that we, you could end up creating a situation where Feinberg finds it so uncomfortable to have to answer for his actions in public that he thinks it's not worth it. In other words, um, cigarette executives nowadays probably don't like to admit what, to what they do in parties. Because, they, you know, everyone thinks, why are you selling the cancer stick? Whereas um, gun individuals probably go, you know what, I sell guns. People think that's great. Well, actually, I think we should be very alert to the fact that what they sell massively increases people's chances of being killed. And that, to me, um, should be railed against. And Mr. Overton, um, can you just, uh, for all of us, give us the website for your organization, Action on Armed Violence, so we can learn more about it and, and support in any way we can? Thank you very much. Yes, it's www.aoav.org.uk. But if you just Google Action on Armed Violence or Yahoo it or whatever your search engine of choice is, Action on Armed Violence, you'll be able to go straight through and learn about the work we do. This is Middle East in Focus. We have been talking about the Orlando massacre and the problem of gun violence domestically and internationally with our guest, Ian Overton, executive director of the London-based organization Action on Armed Violence and author of the book, The Way of the Gun, A Bloody Journey into the World of Firearms. Thanks so much, Mr. Overton, for joining us today. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.